Thank you. Okay, uh, Rick is from uh, the, uh, uh, where, where did my note here go? I had that a moment ago. Program Director of the Wildland Fire Sciences uh, at the uh, Salish Kootenai College, where he has been since 2011. Welcome. I usually don't like microphones, but um, there's been an awful lot of talk about elders, um, <clears throat> an awful lot of talk about uh, um, Spartans, those kinds of things. Um, I'm here to sign up for the court jester. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, what I want to talk about is actually uh, the second or third, um, what I call science light, data light. Uh, presentations that I've given this year, but we've uh, started developing uh, some fire history reconstruction on the uh, reservation itself, and uh, it winds up tying into a lot of different things. And I've been dumped into the middle of it. So one of the things I can wind up doing is helping people understand what's going on with the resource as far as White Park Pine on the uh, Flathead Indian Reservation. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, why CSKT, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, are interested in managing higher elevation forests. There's a, a shift going on. Why research is beginning and some of the aspects of higher elevation fire regimes. And then what kind of cooperative efforts going on between CSK Forestry, CSKT Forestry and the Salish Kootenai College. So we can figure out what, uh, or get a better idea what the state of the um, condition of White Park is on the reservation. So uh, CSKT, they are in the process of uh, developing a new forest management plan to uh, supersede the 2000 edition. Uh, they did talk about White Park restoration planning in that plan. However, they wanted to, uh, to come up front and uh, be a higher priority item. So White Park restoration planning is now being addressed. And uh, what <clears throat> we're calling high elevation non-commodity forest management, you know, getting above 7,000 feet, no longer thinking in terms of what kind of board feet you're generating from a forest, but managing that forest for hydrological intercept, managing that forest for wildland, uh, other wildland uh, recreation use, and other uses that are usually non-traditional. There is a CSKT climate change strategic plan that also calls for take a look at the park pine because it's an important cultural adjunct. And there is a strong cultural connection with white bark pine and other five needle pines that are in the area. So this is the problem. This is uh, the Ashley Lake fire 2006. This is during one of its naughty days. And it wound up uh, devastating. Let's see if I can figure out. That is a white bark stand, pine stand, or was. Did a pretty good job of going over it. Uh, this is now one of the stands that are in question. Do they want to go ahead and uh, make the effort to uh, start restoration efforts on that? We know that fire is a big component on the missions. This is a 1930 shot from uh, pretty much where that's old 93. Highway 93 is about where the photographer is standing, uh, looking towards the mountains. And you can see various and sundry burns. There's some really nice burn sites up here. The Ashley Lake fire, the one I just showed you, is up in, on this shoulder. This is all white bark pine territory, and actually you can see white bark individuals on that stand as you come up and over the Valley Hill. So it's a, it's a big deal uh, to tribal management to <clears throat> start thinking in terms of how can we restore this and how can we keep this as a resource. Oops. Bob, help me. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Tony Harwood, a forester that I was working with, who provided me with this the photo, um, it's <clears throat> a very, very strong cultural adjunct. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of different stories that I've been talking to a lot of different elders about it. You guys have heard some uh, up at the Fernie meetings. Um, <clears throat> a lot of different kinds of uses. And, and of course, in any kind of group of people, you get all sorts of different uh, spectra of uses to, no, we didn't use it at all, to, yeah, we were completely dependent on it for uh, a source of information. The one thing I found is really interesting so far um, is it's apparently a very, very strong uh, constipative. If you eat too much of it, it eats too much of the seeds, and I haven't field tested that yet. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, I'm uh, starting to pick up an awful lot of information and I kind of hope to share down the road. So my drivers, we, 
I come from now a research background. I wound up playing around in research and fire ecology for 20 years before I came back and boarding here in Montana. So there's still a lot of unanswered, unaddressed questions about uh, forest and fire ecology in Western North American ecosystems. We don't know everything. We've got some pretty good ideas, but um, as far as data, we're still data light. It's part of my job now at a tribal college and university to increase student capacity and infrastructure capacity as far as research. We're a four-year liberal arts college, but we need to increase our capacity for doing research, and that's one of the things that, that I'm doing. And then at SKC, you know, I've been trying to increase this skill set, but I also want to have research questions that address things that are important to the tribe, and so that's where this uh, alliance between SKC and tribal forestry is wound up developing. So most of the things that I'm working on right now are things that uh, some of the tribal foresters have come up to me and say, hey, what about this, what about this? Can you address it? I said, sure. One of the things I think is kind of uh, cool to play with. So 1.37 something million acres. Don't forget it. It's right there in the middle of the crown of the continent. And uh, some of the models that we've already seen, yeah, kind of indicate that, yeah, there's white bark here, there's white bark here, there's white bark here. So one of the first things I'm going to want to talk about, though, is we found out that there's a, been a big error perpetuated for about 40 years in uh, their forestry uh, records that we've cleared up, and we know a lot more about the resource now. So what about white bark pine? This is my list to, uh, if I present this to the non-choir, but I'm preaching to the choir right now. We know that white pine blisterus is a problem. We know that uh, the pine beetle is a, a problem. Get down to the bottom, as far as fire regimes, there are very, very few studies. And I'm kind of a fire regime guy. <clears throat> there are major management shifts that they want to address. The tribe really wants to get into restoration. They really want to get into conservation of the ecosystem. And they're really interested in this concept of non-commodity forest management. So <clears throat> we need more information, lots more information. Me. I got kind of interested in this because we'd already started, we being Emily Hardall, uh, Dave McQuethy from MSU, and a couple of other people on uh, developing a fire regime study um, in deep time, essentially, most uh, post ice age, Holocene, Holocene time frames for uh, mixed conifer. Well, it was real easy for me to take that template of that grant, resubmit it to the grant, one of the granting agencies, and lo and behold, I got another grant continue that kind of fire regime work in uh, white bark pine. So it's kind of where we started heading with that. The research itself, well, what kind of fire regimes are there? And uh, it turns out when I start talking to people, they're concentrating on one kind of fire regime. There's actually three. Um, <clears throat> thanks to a lot of Bob's work, we know that's uh, pretty much the story. Three different fire regimes. There's a non-lethal surface fire regime. There's a spatially and temporarily very mixed severity regime and a lethal fire regime. And out of those three, the two that will be studied are the uh, mixed severity and the lethal fire regimes. So they're not easy to study. They're not easy to get to. People haven't done it before. Um, <clears throat> would spatial reconstruction be a question? And that's one of the things that I've been doing in the past. That's one of the things we're addressing here. And so we began sampling and doing spatial fire reconstruction in white bark pine forest. So, <clears throat> the non-lethal. This is a, a real typical non-lethal that uh, most people wind up thinking about. This is North Crow Creek. You can see this from Highway 93. <clears throat> As you're driving north up here, you couldn't see it this morning because it was dark, but <laughs> it's there. Access is a problem here. Uh, this is a helicopter shot that one of the uh, foresters kindly provided me with. But I've been up to that stand, and I'm starting to get old. I hate to admit it. Um, I'm going to need a walker now for the next time I get up here. But it took me five hours to get to that point. Um, <clears throat> and so getting up to these areas and actually uh, doing the spatial reconstruction is going to be problematic. More about that later. Um, <clears throat> the mixed severity regime, another helicopter shot. but. Uh, Emily hired all and I walked walk through here, and we've got a pretty good idea that this is a, a mixed severity fire regime with some of the smaller plots. This is the Hell Roaring area. Um, <clears throat> there are tons of white bark in there, and you just can't see them. They're waving to you. Um, 
on the ground, this is a shot that Emily and I wind up taking, and you can see, you know, it's a bit dark. There's your gallery forest of dead and standing white bark. That's incidentally, that's Forest Service land. Tribal land starts right there at the base. Um, <clears throat> we do have lots of uh, white bark in there, trying to regenerate individuals that are about 14 to 30 years old. And so they, they're uh, making a go at uh, trying to go ahead and restart the, a little bit of white bark stand and forest development there in this area that was cut back in the 1960s for salvage work. And then the lethal fire regime, uh, there's no shortage of it in, in that area. I, I picked this because it's kind of fun to show that individual. That is a 38-inch, uh, 124-foot tall white bark that um, I'm trying to get volunteered for uh, one of the plus trees um, <clears throat> that uh, is standing tall in this uh, otherwise Engelmann spruce subalpine fir forest that ultimately will wind up burning. Um, hopefully not in a nice, in a manner that makes it really, really tough to get, keep this species going. So problem number one, this is the big problem, is how much white bark pine is there? Air photo interpretation from the 1970s indicated there's about 36,000 acres. No notes, no job description. The choices appear to be harvest derived. When I started taking a look at this stuff, I started scratching my head and going, well, why, why did they do it this way? But that's a real typical problem when you go back to 1970s, 1960s, 1950s remote sensing. It fails to describe the, expand, the overall extent of white bark pine on the reservation. And uh, foresters and myself recognized that and we realized that we needed to go ahead and start coming up with a better estimate the interpreter may have had problems with taking a look at white bark pine ID on an aerial photo. I have problems with that, so it's a very understandable problem. It's really, really tough to tell, and especially in these grainier photos, what the species really is. So we call that into question because of the new management paradigms. This is um, a um, GIS output that the tribe did provide for me using that white bark pine um, coverage from the 1970s. They have little bits of it down here in the Jocko, little bits of it along the mission here, a few bits along the uh, Nine Mile or Chapaquan Divide. Um, it kind of peters out. You don't see any stands there. We realize that, hey, there's something wrong here. So, did I, am I breaking it? <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Help! Yay! Don't hit those two down at the bottom. Roger. Good to know. <laughs> yep, she saved. So, <clears throat> where's the white part? Um, I started taking a look at stuff. And we realized the 1972 polygons weren't cutting it, um, <clears throat> and the practices there they were okay for the time, but they just don't make it for the early 21st century making sure I don't hit the wrong button. This is taking a look at an area that we are sampling that does have the overlay on the white bark pine non-dominant. Um, <clears throat> this is the Three Peaks Lake area. That's actually the three, three lakes. This is listed as white bark pine non-dominant. Uh, they got that wrong. That is dominant. That is that classic non-lethal fire regime. Uh, there's little red splotches here where they have white bark pine dominant, but if you start walking through this kind of stuff, you realize that there's a lot more, and actually white bark pine spreads throughout the entire frame of this image. This is a low-level oblique looking at the same thing. Uh, the reason I'm going to use it is because uh, we'll come back to this down the road. Uh, okay, here's some resource, here's some resource, and that's what they marked. Uh, yeah, and I, we can't figure out exactly why they marked it that way, but we just move on and try to uh, make the resource for now. So what to do? Okay, number one, go old school. Walk around and see, and that's what I've been doing the last two years. And then try to develop a predictive model. Um, I'm not a GIS technician, but I can play one on TV. So one of the things I started doing is playing around with our GIS spatial analysts and starting to come up with something that represents uh, the coverage a little bit more. The best option is both. 
I walked around, I saw where it was at, I've come up with my little estimation and my little GIS model, I've gone back out to check my work. So the walk around is 2014, 2015, most of it, it was uh, it's CSKT forestry staff showing me how I could get in and out of these kinds of areas. And we sat down with our GIS spatial analyst, started just throwing out the stuff. Okay, we can find it above 5,900 feet. We don't find it on less than 60% slope. No bare ground and rock. And started to take a look at, you know, what kind of coverage really comes up. Yes, I'm missing variables, but I'm trying to add those variables back in now that I've got a better idea this summer about where it's at. And lo and behold, this is what we get. Same places, but uh, this is actually fancified. Um, the colors are actually showing differences in elevation, but the color portion is where white bark pine is predicted to be, and yes, it's there. Yes, it's there. Yes, it's there on Chapaquin Peak. It's all along the Nine Mile Divide, but the GIS model, look, there's some up here. Look, there's some here. I found those individuals. There's a white part, it's, they're not doing great, but they're there. Uh, the older stuff does not indicate any white bark up here. There's tons of it. <clears throat> you walk around and uh, you know, all of a sudden you're going, hey, there's a white bark, there's a white bark. So we know there's a lot more than what they thought before. The one fail that I've got right now, and it's probably because of rainfall, is this area, Pistol Creek. Didn't find any, and I think it's because it's just too moist of a site. So um, we've increased the acreage. This is the maximum acreage. It's probably going to go smaller. Instead of 36,000 acres of white bark pine on the reservation, there's probably closer to 173,000. So a lot more as far as the resource goes. So you go from 2.6% of the reservation lands to 13.1%. You go to even larger percentages when you consider forested land and what the, the resource really is. We can zoom in on that. I'm going to wind up zooming in on this so I can segue to the actual sampling. Uh, <clears throat> this is, I've walked most of this area now, and it's pretty good. Uh, models are never perfect, but I'm actually kind of pleased with myself on this one. Keep on zooming in, and here's that uh, Three Lakes Peak area again. This whole area is lethal and uh, the mix severity fire regime. This is all that um, non-lethal fire regime. This is, <clears throat> this is roughly three square miles of white, white park and mixed white park. So when you're trying to come up with uh, what do we do with the white park, what are we going to do with it as far as uh, you know, population genetics, we've got to consider these stands too. You know, what are we going to do if I'm going to give them advice to how they manage their species? You don't just manage the cute stuff, the stuff that most people key into. You've got to manage all of this kind of stuff. So problem number two is white bark pine sampling. Access, they've actually got relatively good access up there to the, um, to the lethal and the mix severity stands. The low intensity stands, like uh, most people have to suffer, you have to walk up to them. And actually getting undergraduates to hike these days, what happened to them? <laughs> um, <clears throat> how come we can't have a horse? <clears throat> anyway, um, the Mount Lisa was the hardest to get to. Emily Hardall and I have been sampling for a long time. She and her own projects, mine and my own projects in Southern California on grid sampling to reconstruct fire sizes. And what we've done is uh, we've got a mixed conifer project going on now that we're just now wrapping up. We took the protocol for the mixed conifer project and switched it over to white bark pine. We have a 200 meter by 200 meter grid spacing where at each 200 meter intersection, we're essentially doing um, uh, CFI work, number of trees, the uh, tree demography. We're also coring 40 different individuals in different size classes to get ages. We're taking fire scar samples from each one of those points. Very intensive sampling in these kinds of areas. So uh, this is, an, again, that low, low level of leak shot where this is kind of one of the areas that we're sampling a lot. So uh, there's that Three Lakes Peak again. Uh, this is for Bob. This is where we took Bob up. We had to get Bob approval on this. 
<clears throat> this is uh, one of the blessings of Google Earth is you can take a look at this. Uh, you do get uh, <clears throat> the white bar gods to come up and take a look. Um, this is a quick shot of the grid itself. You can see the 200 meter by 200 meter grid right now. As of yesterday, I had 1.7 square kilometers of gridded area up there. You train. Got, um, <clears throat> just a quick explanation of this. Uh, there's both cut lodge pole and white bark in front of me. We use those stumps to do the fire reconstruction. Uh, show people how to decor correctly, not at four and a half feet uh, DBH. We crow, uh, core at the base. You get a proper age. You can reconstruct fire scars. This is dark, but this is a white bark pine stump with three fires on it. And yeah, there are older individuals around. <clears throat> Takes you a while for you to focus. Say hi to Emily Hardall. This is a big tree. And we've just now gotten tribal permission to go ahead and sample it and try to estimate how old it is. Scratching our heads and standing at it, we think it's in excess of 1,500 years. Comb collection. Now, this is a bad photograph. This is the, one of the bad things about carrying your uh, smartphone with you. Hey, they were doing comb collection in that area this year because there's a lot of trees and cone. <clears throat> so what's the, the big story? There's more resource than previously thought. The tribe's really tickled with that. This changes the approach to thinking about that high elevation non-commodity forest in the future. The next questions, the usual things. Models need defining. We need to see how much white bark pine actually got sampled in 2016. I've actually got it almost four and a half square kilometers now on two sites. Uh, <clears throat> the data is just not coming in. Hopefully you guys will let me grace you with presenting the data next year. Uh, additional funds are out there. We just got ref we just got funded for a graduate student out of the University of Idaho on this. Um, overall, though, I think it's critical to backstop active restoration efforts with solid fire ecology and fire history data. That's my bias, and that's the way I'd like to see SKC go ahead and carry the research in this unique forest resource. <clears throat> 